So we talk a lot about isomers in this class, and I know that there was a homework problem about it, or a few. Uh, what are isomers, specifically constitutional isomers? So like compounds with the same formula, but I guess they're different, like different names and different properties. Uh, yeah, the main idea for constitutional isomers is they have the same molecular formula. But different connectivities of atoms. Because I was looking at the homework and I was seeing that people were missing a lot of these problems. Um, so even though the book deals with it, I thought maybe a little bit of review would be helpful. So for example, the book, uh, we, the one example we've already seen uh, in the notes was C2H6O. The thing that you want to remember, if there's no charge, carbon makes how many bonds? Four. Four, good. Hydrogen makes? One. One, one. and oxygen makes? Two. Two, good. And it has two lone pairs if we were to draw them. So for example, we could start by saying, okay, I'm gonna draw two carbons together. I still need to get carbon to four bonds. So I could put the oxygen on either one of these carbons. So I've got all the atoms taken care of right now, except for hydrogen, right? How many spaces do I still have left to fill here? I still have six spaces. So one, two, three. Now that carbon has an octet. Four, five, that carbon has an octet. And six, the oxygen has two lone pairs and it's got two bonds, so it has an octet. Good. And the only other way I could come up with that would work would be to say, well, what if I went carbon, oxygen, carbon? And then each of these would need three hydrogens. And there is no other way to do this. Those are the only two isomers. Um, for, for this formula. As the number of carbons gets and hydrogens get bigger, you start getting you know five isomers, 10 isomers into the tens of thousands of isomers, okay? You'll also notice there's no way to do this with a double bond. Like if you tried doing it with, let's say, let's try to do a double bond. Let's say that the carbon had a double bond to carbon. How many bonds would this carbon on the left need now still? It's got a double bond, so it would need how many more bonds? Yeah. Two hydrogens, right? The carbon on the right also needs two. And one of those atoms has to be oxygen, right? Because the formula says there has to be an oxygen. Oxygen can only make one bond. And the only other atom left here is hydrogen. You see, there's no way we could do six hydrogens if there's a double bond, correct? Yeah. We'll learn in a few chapters uh, about this thing called the uh, unsaturation number that will predict whether or not you can have a double bond or not. There's also no way to do this in a ring. Um, in this compound here. Let me do another one that won't have any double bonds. Let's do C5 
H12. And this might be one of the homework problems. I know from experience that there are three isomers. There are three. So what's probably the easiest way to start? I would always start with all five carbons going in a straight line. We call that a chain, by the way, okay? When you start with all five carbons in a chain. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So I've gotten rid of all five of the carbons so the rest has to be hydrogens. And since carbon must make four bonds, please make sure that's way up in your head. Carbon must make four bonds, unless it's got a charge on it, which is unusual. And when I ask you an isomer problem, I'm gonna say these are all gonna be neutral, no charges. And everything needs an octet. How many spots are there right there? You could probably guess there are 12, yeah. We're going to learn an easier way to do this, by the way, very shortly. In chapter two, instead of drawing it like this, we'll draw it like this. Much easier to draw. Okay. Maybe a little harder to understand, but much easier to draw. What's another way we could do it? Instead of doing five in a row, what could I do instead? Four in a row. Four in a row. And then do what? Have a carbon with one of the two middle ones. Yeah, why not one of the end ones? And it would still be like the same thing as the first one. How about if I drew this down? Is it the same or still the same? Same or different? It would still be the same. It's exactly the same as this one. Yeah, that's right. If I just put the CH3 down and the hydrogen up, it's still the same thing. That's the hardest part, again, for people is to see when it's the same and when it's different. It takes lots of practice. It becomes easy when you know how to name the compound because they would have different names. but until then, okay. So this is clearly different because this carbon right here is bonded to three carbons. None of these carbons are bonded to more than two. Good. And I think you can agree with me that if we fill in all the hydrogens here, there will be 12 of them. Sometimes with these problems, it's easier just to leave the hydrogens out altogether, so long as you know that there's 12. And we will learn in the next chapter that it would be easier just to draw it like this. That means the same thing, okay? And then finally, uh, what if I put this, this CH2 over here? On the second one instead of the third. It's different, right? No, it would still be the same. Oh, man. Because it would be the same thing turned around. I see. So it's like, okay. It's still That's why it's hard. Yeah, because it's like you don't want it to be the same one. There are so many ways to draw this. And so many people will think, oh, it's different, it's different. No, nope. same thing. For example, if I just leave out the hydrogens, is this the same or different? 
it's still the same. Still the same. Yeah. Uh, that looks ugly. Let me change that real quick. Yeah, that's still the same. It's basically, yeah, forget the hydrogens for right now. Just look at the chain. There's two in a row. So one, two. And then we call this a branch. And the branch goes to two different carbons. So one here. It's the same thing. What's the third way of doing it? Would you be able to do double bonds with uh, these carbons? You wouldn't. Try it and you'll see that you, you will run out. If you try to do double bonds, you won't get, you'll get to 10 hydrogens and you'll be stuck. Every double bond takes you down by two hydrogens. Okay. Uh, that's something we'll learn in the formulas uh, for how these work. But yeah, you can't. And you can't do a ring either. So if we've tried doing five in a row, we've tried doing four in a row, and we found that we, if we put this on the third one, that's the same as if we put it on the second one. So why don't we try doing instead of four in a row, how about three in a row, and then do what? Would you put it on the first one on the top and then this, the third one on the bottom? Like this? Hmm. Mm. I don't know. That's the same as the first one. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Straight. Oh yeah, you're true. You're so true. Okay. Yeah, because I could always just take this one and say, uh, 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 put it right there. Take this one. Same thing. Yeah, and when you're doing this, yeah, I, I say just ignore the hydrogens because they really get in the way um, until later on you're trying to make sure that it's the right one. So try three in a row. And trust me, three is the longest you can go on this. So what's the only other way you could do this? Oh, do you put two in the middle? Two in the middle. Very good. That's the only other way you can do it. These are like brain teasers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they are. Uh, I'm going to do this in a different notation. I'm just going to write CH3, CH3, CH3. See, I'm going to write the H3 in front, and that still means they belong to the carbon. But how many hydrogens is that total? You're missing a CH3, CH2. That's 12. Nope. No, this is everything. Or if that doesn't seem to work, there we can, I'll just draw them all out. Carbon needs how many bonds again? Four. Four? The four middle four. one already has four, right? All the other ones need how many? Uh, three yeah, more. They need three more. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, there we go. And I would just put hydrogens on each of those. And as we will learn, these all have different names and they have different properties. This one's called pentane, this one is called to methyl butane, and this one is called 2,2-dimethylpropane. We'll worry about that in chapter four. The next one up, which we don't have time to do, is C6H14, and I think that has five isomers. Um, and then I think C7 has nine, I can't remember, but... Uh, I usually like to ask these questions, but what I'll usually do is I'll give one that's kind of complicated and say, you know, there's maybe 15 different answers, draw four of them, you know, just make sure you don't draw the same four. Cause that's always easier in my opinion, to say, just pick any four, just draw any four. Here, let me do one with a double bond. 
C3. Let's make it a little tricky. C3, H6, O. Not tricky. Let's make it so that this one has many, many, many choices. C3, H6, O. If you try doing this without a double bond, like let's say you did all these C's together. We've got three carbons here, right? And an oxygen. So how many atoms would you still need if you for the hydrogens? You'd need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to get to the octet, right? So that's not going to work. C3H6O. We don't have eight hydrogens. We only have six. So we can put a double bond. Where do you want to put a double bond? There's a whole bunch of places here. Oxygen. Uh, carbon and the oxygen? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to get rid of one, two. Those were going to be hydrogens, okay? So I'm just going to get rid of those two. So I put a double bond there. Now, will this work? Do I have enough room for six hydrogens? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? Does every atom have the right number of bonds? Carbon needs four, oxygen needs two, and two lone pairs. So it's happy. Any questions about that? Let me still use the same skeleton. I say don't, you know, don't, don't make it harder than you have to. You'll eventually run out. How about instead of putting the double bond between the carbon and the oxygen, what if I put it here? Then this carbon needs, the carbon on the left needs how many more atoms? Or bonds, sorry. Three. Three. Three more. How about the one in the middle? One. Needs one. Doesn't matter if I draw it up or down. The next carbon needs how many more? One. One. And oxygen needs only two bonds, right? So how many more bonds does it need? One. One. Good. So we can fill in hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wait, wh why does oxygen just need one more bond again? Oh, because it has uh, two lower. Yeah, the bonding patterns are carbon makes four bonds, right? Oh, yeah. Nitrogen makes three and has a lone pair. Oxygen makes two and has two lone pairs. And the halogens make one. Hmm. And hydrogen makes one. This it is for really molecules good. that are not ions, okay? I see. okay? The only exception I can think of to this is carbon monoxide. Other than that, pretty much every neutral molecule, um, and that would be, that does have charges, but the charges cancel out. So that's why it looks a little tricky. It's because they have two charges that cancel. But other than that, they pretty much all follow these patterns here, if, if they're stable. And we will find out next semester that this is not a good choice because it's actually the same molecule as this in solution. In water, it, this would immediately change into this. But anyway, you don't know that. That's okay. Anyway, um, how about this? That's clearly a different pattern, right? Because the oxygen is in between two carbons. Can the oxygen make a double bond the way it's drawn? No. No, because it's already got it already has its two bonds, right? 
So we can't make a double bond on the left. So this carbon needs three hydrogens. Where does the double bond have to be? Because this carbon needs four and this one needs three. And I don't have five more hydrogens. I only have three more hydrogens. So where do I want to make my double bond? In between the last two carbons. Exactly. In between the last two carbons. And I now, this carbon needs one hydrogen. This one needs two hydrogens. So hydrogens are kind of like the caps. You, you cap them off with hydrogens. So these are three different isomers. They're all isomers of each other because they all have that formula. And this could get really wacko if we, well, not wacko wacko, but I mean, here's another one. This one has a ring. Right? Three carbons and an oxygen. This carbon needs two hydrogens. This one needs two hydrogens. This one needs two hydrogens. Does the oxygen want hydrogens? No. No, because it's got it's two bonds, it's happy. Yeah. So really all this is is just playing around with this. And you see, the more complicated the formula the easier this gets, in my opinion, because it's very hard to accidentally draw the same thing twice, right? Because you can just go totally different patterns and still and end up with totally different molecules. It's always crazy when I give a complicated pattern and someone draws the same one three different ways. It's like, no, don't do that. So we can definitely see these are different because this is the only one with a carbon oxygen double bond, right? of these four. Uh, this one is the only one with an OH bond, right? Of these four. This is the only one that makes a ring. And this one by default must be different because it's not the same as these other guys here. So, and there's many, many more. I mean, you know, I could do a three membered ring So that's another one. So all you're doing is playing around with the patterns so that you're coming up with them there. So those are all isomers. So for the test, you would just give us like a, a formula and just tell us to do four different patterns or- Or I could do this one and say, give me the only two. So I'll either tell you how many there are, or I could do like this, you know, or, you know, what I'll do is I'll usually do this and then I'll combine this with something from chapter two where I say each one has to have a different functional group, which is going to mean one of them has to have a carbon oxygen double bond. One of them has to have a carbon carbon double bond. One of them has to have an OH, you know, things like that. Um, and so we'll go. You, uh, well, when I post an old exam, you can see an example. In fact, I think I've already posted an old exam. So that's usually how I will do things is just say, draw me several different ones. And still a lot of people totally miss this question because what do they do? They forget to follow the patterns. These patterns, this is the whole point of what I'm checking. Carbon four bonds, nitrogen, okay. Huge cardin like moral cardinal sin number one, carbon never makes five bonds. Why can carbon never make five bonds? Breaks the octet rule? Yeah, it exceeds the octet rule. Um, good. It will sometimes make three bonds, but only if it has a charge. Okay. Um, but I always ask for ones that don't have charge. When I ask this question, I only want neutral compounds. And I only want things that follow the octet rule. You know, things that don't follow the octet rule tend to be what? Tend to be really unstable, reactive. Okay. Okay. So let's continue on from where we were at. 
sorry, I, I just, that was kind of needed to talk about that stuff. I don't know how it never made it into my notes. Okay, so we were talking about atomic orbitals. And really, of all the four types of orbitals in this class, S, P, D, and F, really the only two that make much difference are S and P. Because carbon is, what's carbon's electron configuration? 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So s's and p's. We don't worry too much about d's or f's at all in this class. So it's important to know these different orbitals right here. Okay, so a 1s orbital is very important for which element? What's the only element that we're going to worry about that only has a 1s orbital and no other orbitals? It's going to be Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yeah. We don't care about helium because helium doesn't react with anything. So don't worry about helium. And then we worry about 2s because carbon has a 2s orbital, um, nitrogen has a 2s orbital, oxygen, all the other atoms do. Okay. So remember I talked about nodes, which was where the wave function goes to zero. Okay. Or we can say you can't find an electron right there. The electron can be above, it can be below, but it can't be right there at that node or anywhere along this plane above or below it, okay? It turns out a 2s has one node right there, meaning it can be inside the, there, it can be outside, but it can't be right on the node. It's like the wave just disappears to zero right there. If we looked at the pattern, we would find that 2s has one node, 3s would have two nodes, 4s would have three nodes. Only worry about 2s though, and the node won't make too much of a difference anyway. S orbitals always come in sets of one, right? So 2s, how many electrons can 2s hold? Two. Two, maximum, good. What about p orbitals? p orbitals always come in sets of? Six. Of three, oh. right? Which is why they can hold at most, how many electrons? I heard it already. Six, six. yeah, they can hold up to six. So this is an orbital, the py orbital. It's along the y-axis. It can hold up to two electrons. Has nothing to do with the fact that there's two lobes there. All orbitals hold up to two electrons, regardless of how they're shaped. This one can hold up to two electrons, and this one can hold up to two electrons. So a maximum of six. We say these orbitals are degenerate. What does degenerate mean? Do you remember? And it has to do with energy. Degenerate means energy is the same. same. So electrons in here have the same energy as electrons in here, have the same energy as electrons here. Where is the node on 2py? Where is the node? Zero, zero. Uh, the origin? Yes, but it's actually a whole plane. It's a whole plane. It's the whole xz plane. Okay, so it can be above the XC plane. It can be below the XC plane. It cannot be on the XC plane. How about for the PX? Which plane is the node? It can be, it's, it's the only letters that aren't there. It's YZ, oh. good. And which plane is the node here? It's the XY plane. Good, meaning it can be above the xy plane, it can be below the xy plane, but it can't be on the xy plane, the electrons. Okay. Quick review, you remember this stuff from Chem 120 and 130? The electron configurations, we've talked about those, and we've also talked about these, these are the energy diagrams that we fill them in. Quick review, why do we, uh, we're always filling in order from lowest to highest. What is the name of that rule that tells us we must fill the electrons from lowest to highest? 
to highest energy? Hun's rule? Uh, almost. Not, it's a different uh, one. Oh, principle? Alf Bao. You guys all guessed the wrong one. Alf Bao. Alf Bao principle is you always fill the lowest energy first, and then you go to the next highest, and then the next highest. Okay. Why do these electrons get filled up one at a time instead of why doesn't this electron go over here? Whose rule is that? That is Hun's. Hun's rule. Yeah. Hun's rule says when orbitals are the same energy, that is degenerate. Remember, I used that word degenerate. When they are degenerate, you give each orbital one electron and they have to be the same spin. Generally, they're parallel spins until each one has one electron. And then you start pairing them up. Uh, the up arrow again means spin up, the down arrow means spin down. Which rule tells us that they have to be opposites if you put them together? I heard that one also. Starts with a P. Poly exclusion. Exactly, the Pauli exclusion principle. So those were our three rules. The Aufbau principle says you always fill orbitals or subshells from lowest energy to highest. Pauli exclusion principle says you always fill uh, orbitals up with electrons with opposite spins. And Hun's rule says when orbitals are the same in energy, you fill them up one at a time with electrons before you pair them up. Okay. Now we're not really going to be interested in atoms by themselves. We're going to be interested in molecules. We want to take the atoms and put the atoms together. And so we need theories that tell us how we do this. What we say is we're going to imagine that an electron is just like a wave. As we said earlier, Electrons are like waves. We're going to use red for right now to mean that the wave is positive amplitude here and it's negative amplitude here. Okay. Again, not positive charge, negative charge. Electrons are always negative charge. But if you think of an electron as being like a wave, it's a positive amplitude or it can go down below. And this would be the negative amplitude. So when waves come together, they can do two things. They can add. So if two waves both have the same amplitude, so they're both positive, in other words, if they come together, they will make a bigger wave. And they reinforce each other. This is called constructive interference. So two waves adding together. That's going to be important for us because that means bond. Constructive interference means we're making a bond. So when these two electrons come together, if they construct, they give you a bond. If they are opposites, think of this here. Think of this as being like a wave of water and this being a trough of water or below. What's going to happen to the water here? In the wave on the left, it's just going to drop right into the one on the right, and it will basically cancel out. That is called what? If this is called a bond, what is this called? You know, it starts with an A. An antibond. Okay, so this is a bond. And this is an antibond. And wherever we get an antibond, we get a thing called a node. That's where the orbital just disappears to zero. So we're going to take our atomic orbitals and bring them together to form molecular orbitals. Okay. The simplest example of this is hydrogen. So we have hydrogen here nucleus in the middle, another hydrogen with another nucleus in the middle. They come together 
And if they're constructive, so in other words, if their amplitudes are both positive or both negative, they will come together and form a bond. Okay. Where do the bonded electrons spend most of their time? Mostly between the two atoms, okay? This is called a molecular orbital right here in its own little way. Well, technically we haven't gotten into molecular orbital theory here, but you'll notice where is the most concentrated space? It's in between the atoms. So those electrons are going to spend most of their time there in between the atoms. So now we're combining all these theories together to a new theory called molecular orbital theory. And we talked about this chapter nine of chemistry 130. Okay. So atomic orbitals come together either in a constructive way or a destructive way. If they come together in a constructive way, we get what's called a bonding orbital, a bonding molecular orbital. If they come together in a destructive way, we get what's called an antibonding orbital. A couple very important notes in the way that we're going to show these, first of all, as diagrams. First, on the left and the right, what kind of orbitals are we putting? Are they atomic or molecular orbitals? 1s is the orbital of an atom. Okay, so this says this is a hydrogen atom. It's got a 1s electron. This is a different hydrogen atom. It has a 1s. The middle are the molecular orbitals where we're showing that these come together. The other important thing to understand here is if you start with two atomic orbitals, you must end with two molecular orbitals. The number of orbitals always stays the same, total number. So if I've got two orbitals here, I have two orbitals here. Bonding orbitals are always lower in energy than the original atomic orbitals. Otherwise, why would something bond? It doesn't want to generally become more unstable. The atoms want to become more stable. So they join together in a bonding orbital. Conversely, an antibonding orbital is always higher in energy. It's almost like a bonding and an antibonding add up to a nothing, to a canceling in a way. Okay. So what kinds of things make this higher in energy? Well, they have different amplitudes and there's a node in, the, in, in between. The electrons don't want to be in between. It's almost like a negative bond if we could say that such a thing exists, okay? So we still follow the Aufbau principle. Where do the two electrons wanna go? To the lower or the higher orbital. You always fill the electrons first in the lower. So this diagram is just saying these two electrons here, they are the same as these two. They always go into the lower orbital first. Okay, so this is the MO diagram for hydrogen. We don't need to draw out all the pictures here. We could just call this S, 1S, and 1S with a star. Any questions about this right here? Uh, yes, is this a, a hydrogen, um, the bond? Is it like, uh, is it bonding with another one? No, this is just two hydrogens bonding together. That's oh, just all. two hydrogens? Okay. Yeah, it's just a single molecule here. So if we were to draw this, the easiest way to draw this would be as so. So these are the two hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen's electron configuration is 1s1. And for right now, I'm gonna make these opposite and spin. 
so that they can come together. So those are the atomic orbitals. In blue, I'm going to do the molecular orbitals. So one is lower in energy and one is higher in energy. And the notation we use is sigma 1s because you're using 1s orbitals. And this one is sigma star 1s. Star means antibonding. No star means bonding. And then we usually connect these with dotted lines. I'm hoping that looks familiar from Chem 130. So the atoms have how many electrons total? There's one electron here on the left and one electron here on the right. So we take those electrons and we stick them in here. So you fill first the bottom and no more electrons left. So that's it. Okay. What about helium? Helium will have, for the most part, the same diagram, except what? What's different about the two heliums than the hydrogens? If this was helium, what would be different? Would there be another um, electron in each of the orbitals, the 1s exactly. orbitals? Yeah, because helium is 1s2, right? So there's four electrons. So this time I have four electrons to start with. The first two electrons will go into the bonding orbital, but I still have two more. And those would have to go in the antibonding orbital. So if you forget, for the time being, if we just ignore all this stuff in the middle, just ignore this stuff in the middle. This is two helium atoms separate. Okay? No bonds at all. But if you bring them together, now compare it to the picture inside. We have a bond, which makes it more stable, but we have an antibond, which makes them less stable. So what is the net effect? More stable plus much less stable would mean no bond at all, okay? So if a molecule has all its bonding and antibondings, will it be stable or unstable? It will be unstable. And that's because antibonding, you know, electrons in antibonding orbitals destabilize a molecule. Destabilized means higher energy or low energy? Higher. Higher, yeah. Stabilized means lower, destabilized means higher, good. So the energy of HE2 compared to 2HE, HE2 is higher in energy and so therefore, Technically, technically this one is, the antibonding is usually higher in energy than this one is lower. So H2 is higher in energy. That means it is less stable.
Okay. And so helium is a noble gas. Do we expect it to bond with other atoms or do we want, do, do we expect the atoms to be all by themselves? Noble gases, do they like to bond or they don't bond? They don't bond. Yeah. yeah, we have no reason to believe that they would bond. So does this theory seem consistent with the chemical behavior? It should, right? If they tried to come together and bond, they would just as soon make an antibond, no bonds. They're not gonna wanna bond, okay? And that's why ultimately it exists in an atomic form, the non-molecular. It's because of this, the helium atoms by themselves are more stable, lower in energy than the HE2 molecule. If you were to draw these diagrams out for all of these things where you have just as many bonding as antibondings, that's gonna always be the case for noble gases. Noble gases have just as many bonding as antibonding. So they never wanna to come together. They wanna to be just, they're totally stable atoms that do not want to come together you won't see a noble gas coming with another, another noble gas. Okay. Now this theory is very simple for H2 and HE2 because there's only two atomic orbitals. It gets much, much more complicated very quickly for molecules like CH3Br. Why? Because carbon has one S orbitals, two s orbitals, two p orbitals. The hydrogens have one s. Bromine has one s orbitals, two s orbitals, two p, three s, three p. They have a lot of orbitals, okay? So this theory gets very, very complicated and you need computers to start drawing out the various structures. And it's actually rather expensive software in many cases here. But just to show you what they look like, because we will, instead of drawing them on our own, I'll often give you pictures here, okay? This picture is one orbital, okay? Does it seem to be bonding or antibonding right here? They're opposite colors here, but on the same time we have this. So this is actually kind of a bonding across this side, and this is bonding across this side with a node in between. And this whole thing is one S orbital. This is an antibonding one because there's a node in between here and here. Now we're only gonna look at MOs for very, very specific cases. This is way too crazy for us to worry about, okay? And so, but the important thing to understand is this. When the electrons are in their most stable positions, we call that the ground state, Electrons will only occupy some MOs and not others. Which orbitals will they fill first? This was again Aufbau. You always fill the highest or lowest in energy first. Lowest. 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 So if I had 20 different molecular orbitals, you always fill the most stable ones first, and then you start filling less stable ones until we get there. Now, it's not really until chapter 16 that we'll start looking at some more detailed pictures here. But MO theory, again, just says that these electrons can be there. The other thing about this, remember, this is an orbital. MO theory tells us what? The electrons are stuck on an atom or they can travel over the whole molecule. If an electron is in these two orbitals, are they stuck or are they flying over the whole thing? If you look at that picture. According to MO theory, they're not stuck on the atoms. The electrons can go over the entire molecule. And that's actually more accurate. The electrons are not stuck with the atoms here. They, are, they can move in various places in space. So that's a big difference with this theory here. So we're gonna have to pick and choose between two theories. Vesper theory, which tells us a lot about shapes, a molecular orbital theory, which is gonna tell us a lot about energies, what's more stable and what's less stable. And we kind of use a combina combination of both theories to tell us you know, about a molecule. Unfortunately, we don't have a single theory about bonds that works for all scenarios. Just today in the last class, I was talking about yet another bonding theory called crystal field theory 
When do you use crystal field theory? If you remember from Chem 140, where do we use crystal field theory? Solids. For what? Solids. Like. Uh, no, not solids. We use them for transition metal complexes. You guys remember this stuff from last semester? Transition metal complexes like uh, FeCl6 three minus or um, blah, 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 blah. This is what I was doing today with them. Uh, let's see. Potassium trifluoropalidate too, all these things here. Crystal field theory tells us how metals bond with molecules, transition metals. So that's its own whole totally different theory. Since we're not worrying about transition metals, we don't have to worry about crystal field theory, okay? So the theories we look at are molecular orbital theory and this valence bond theory, which is going to relate to Vesper theory, okay? All right, let's go back and look at our picture here for carbon. Carbon, here's carbon. Which orbitals have electrons in them? 1s has two electrons. We don't care about 1s though, because that's the core. Remember we talked about core electrons and valence electrons. 2s and 2p are called what? What are these electrons called in 2s and 2p? Valence? Yeah, they're the valence electrons. Carbon has how many valence electrons? Four. Four. Four, good. Now let's think about this. If these guys are gonna to come together to bond, where are the electrons? Two of them are in 2s, right? And they already seem pretty happy because they're already combined. Two electrons are in 2p. Where are the p orbitals again relative to each other? What is the angles of these two p's relative to each other? They're all on different axes. And what's the angles between those axes? 90. 90. So they're all perpendicular to each other, right? Yeah. So the electron in this orbital should be perpendicular to the electron to the uh, orbital over here, right? And this orbital over here has nothing. It's empty. So that should mean that carbon should only want to make 90 degree bonds between its different atoms because these are 90 degrees and these are 90 degrees. But unfortunately, reality comes in and messes everything up. We have very clear evidence from a thing called X-ray crystallography that those are not 90 degree angles. Uh-uh. In a molecule like methane, the angles are equal. They are all 109.5. We know this to be true. It is known, okay? And the bonds are also equal in length. So this electron configuration doesn't seem to kind of work with reality for molecules like methane. Uh, what kind of a shape is this called, by the way? Tetrahedral. That's called tetrahedral, right? Tetrahedral. So we have to tweak the theory a bit. And we use this theory a lot. It is a theory that the book will not tell you is controversial, but is quite controversial. Um, but it works beautifully for organic chemistry. So we're just gonna pretend it's not controversial at all. And it works beautifully for us. And then as you get more advanced, you'll run into professors who go, oh, that's not the way it is. And, so you just say, fine, yeah, 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 okay. Um, I'm gonna live in my little fantasy world and say it's fine because it will make my life so much easier if I believe in this, okay? What we say is we're going to say, all right, fine. These are all 90 degrees to each other. It doesn't work. It doesn't explain how we can get 109.5 degree angles. So the first thing we're gonna say is, well, if I want to make four bonds, these two electrons can't be stuck together. I need how many electrons? If I want to make four bonds, I need 
carbon to have four valence electrons. So I'm going to take these two electrons away and put them in separate orbitals. Okay. So I've got one electron in 2s, two, uh, three electrons in 2p. These all want another electron, right? They all would love to find another electron so they can get paired up. So let's say we stick four hydrogen atoms on here. So I'll stick a hydrogen atom with here. It has one electron, a hydrogen atom with here. It has one. And then it sounds great, except again, we run into that problem. All of these orbitals are 90 degrees to each other. And this one is smooshed in the middle. So we're still stuck. This model says 90 degrees, not 109.5, not tetrahedral. So we come up with this concept that's really cool called hybridization. We say, all right, it's not going to be 2s. It's not going to be 2p. Let's squish these together. Let's make, if I've got four atomic orbitals here, let's bring them all together and make four new kind of orbitals. And those are called hybrid orbitals. So I take this s orbital and these three 2p orbitals, I bring them together and I make what are called hybrid orbitals. The orbitals that are hybrids are all equal in energy and they all point away from each other to give us the shape that we want, a tetrahedron. They are no longer called S and P. They come up with a new name. And the name comes from what they were derived from. It came from one S orbital and three P orbitals, right? So the name of this, these new orbitals are SP3. Does that sound familiar from Chem 130? SP3, hopefully, okay. It makes much more sense now. Oh, okay, does it? Yeah. Why, was it really weird when you saw it before? Yeah, like it just didn't make sense. And I was like, I don't know where you're getting any of this from. But now that like you can actually see the movement happening, it makes sense. Yeah, it's really very important to us. And the way I would explain this is with math functions, but I think it scares people, so I'm not going to do it. But it's really, remember, an orbital is just, this is just a math function, and these are just math functions. And what can you do to math functions? You can add them together, and you can multiply them, and you just come up with new math. That's all. So this was like a sine, and this was like sines and cosines, and you add them together, and you now have new functions. That's all it is. You just have new math functions, and that's where they are. Who are they most similar to? Remember, these are all, it's, these are like the children of these guys. Who do they look more like, S or Ps? If their parents are one S, I know you can't have four parents, but imagine you do have four parents. Who is gonna have a bigger influence, S or P based on this picture? The P? Yeah, they're gonna look more like P orbitals. They're gonna look more like P orbitals because Three quarters of the parents are p orbitals, and one quarter is s. So this is what an sp3 orbital looks like. So it looks more like what, s or more like p? It looks more like p. How is it, how can you see the s? It's kind of tricky, but if you look at this picture and you compare it to, this picture, the P's are a lot longer. Um, they're not as round, so to speak. I know that's kind of weird to say, but but the, an SP3 orbital is a little bit more round over here. Also, they're not equal in terms of the lobe size. Again, the colors just mean this is where it's positive amplitude, this is where it's negative amplitude. Okay. So there are how many of them? If you started with four orbitals, you always end with four hybrids. There are four sp3 orbitals, and each of them has one electron in it. Okay. So this is what we get now. This carbon has four sp3 orbitals. What am I not showing, by the way? Compare this picture to over here. What part is not shown? The node. 
uh, the node and the blue part, okay? Imagine the red part is just much bigger than the blue part. The blue part is there, it's just hidden. It's all covered up. So don't worry about it, it's there. They're just, we're not showing the blue piece, okay? So now this carbon has four atomic orbital, four hybrid orbitals. It can come together with hydrogen, which has one electron. And so now we put them together. This hydrogen comes together with this sp3 orbital, this hydrogen with this sp3, et cetera, all the way. And we end up with methane. Are the bonds equally long or different length? They should all be, they're all the same kind of orbital, so they all should be the same length. And the bond angles should all be the same. 109.5. When a carbon is sp3, we call it sp3 carbon, or we sometimes call it tetrahedral carbon. Because what's the shape right there again? That shape is a tetrahedron. sp3 carbon always means tetrahedron, always going to be a tetrahedral shape. Good. Let's test your artistic skills. I wanna do the same thing now for ethane, which is C2H6. So C2H6. How many bonds does each carbon need to make? Or how many atoms is it bonded to? I'm sorry. Four. Yeah, whenever carbon needs to make, to bond to four different, that's key, four different atoms, it's always going to be sp3. So whenever carbon is, and I'll give you a formula for figuring this out, very easy. Carbon needs to make four, bond to four different atoms. So these are both sp3. So this carbon, SP3 orbitals always come in sets of how many? As we just saw. Four. Four, yeah. So there's an SP3. This is an SP3. This is an SP3. This is an SP3. What's the name of the orbital that hydrogen is using? It's not hybridized. So what's that orbital right there for hydrogen? 1S. 1S, good. Hydrogen uses its 1S orbitals. Okay, that's going to be too small. Let me get rid of that. Okay, so how are the carbons going to bond to each other? They're going to use their... Sigma bonds. They're gonna use their hybrid orbitals. Okay, so this is sp3 and this is sp3. So the two carbons are joining together by putting an sp3 orbital from one to the other, and they overlap on each other. How many electrons are there in between here? Two electrons, okay? I would put them in that spot right there, but I'm running out of space. Yeah, let me try to do it again. And I'll do it with the computer later on anyway, okay. Okay, so we've got two electrons there. This is sp3, sp3. And then the carbon also will have how many more? We need at least three more on each carbon. And what are these carbons bonded to besides the carbon? They're also bonded to mm -hmm. hydrogens. And hydrogen uses its 1s. 1s, good. So this is a hydrogen. And this is a hydrogen. And we've got two electrons in there. And this is a hydrogen. 
Wherever they're overlapping, they have two electrons. And all the bonds are approximately what? What degree? 109. 109.5, very good. Yeah. They're not gonna be exactly 109 because the atoms aren't all the same, but they'll be very close, very close to 109.5. So if I asked you the bond angles, you'd just say 109.5. What about water? Hybrid orbitals do two things. They make this kind of a bond, which we're gonna call a sigma bond later on. Sigma bonds mean they overlap right on top of each other like this. All of these are sigma bonds. So they're used to make sigma bonds where they overlap or they can hold lone pairs. That's what they get used for. So if I do water, How many atoms is oxygen bonded to? Different atoms? There's two hydrogens, right? So it needs to bond to two different atoms. And how many lone pairs does oxygen have? It has two. So the oxygen we would also assume is sp3. The oxygen needs to use two electrons in each of its orbitals there. And this is again, kind of controversial, but it works beautifully. And then these will be hydrogens. Why is it controversial? Uh, because it only works for really small atoms and it immediately starts breaking down uh, as you get beyond oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine. I've had some people say this doesn't even work for nitrogen and oxygen. It only works for carbon. And even then it's very weak. Um, but in organic chemistry, it tends to work very well for shapes. It turns, it works very well for bond lengths. So it's got very good predictive values. And if you need to know any more details, uh, the computer modeling that we can do nowadays is so sophisticated that can, it, it can take into account all the exceptions for the most part and come up with the reality. So in other words, it's a model that seems to work well about 90% of the time. And when it doesn't work, we tweak the model. So what does this tell us? We don't know everything, okay? And no one model is good enough to capture everything. If we tried to focus on those details, this class would take three years and you would come out of this class wanting to commit suicide. So you don't want, we want to work with nice generalizations, even if they're not 100% true. That's why I love this class, but really started losing interest in advanced because then this is the thing about, about chemistry. So now I have to tell you the chemistry story, okay? When I graduated high school, the thought that went through my head, I kid you not, I had taken chemistry in 10th grade and I took AP chemistry in 12th grade. As I was getting my diploma it was, thank God, I never have to take another chemistry class in my life. I hate chemistry. And I was going to music school. So I got into a music conservatory and that's where I was going. And yet here I end up as a chemistry major because I discovered organic chemistry and I love organic chemistry. It's got this beautiful picture. But then when you get to advanced organic chemistry, it becomes really obsessed with, well, this molecule is a, an exception and this molecule is an exception. And that's why I hated chemistry when I first learned it as a student is because every time you learn something, what does it always have with it? Well, this is always true, but not here. And this is always true, but not here. And this is always true, but not here. This class doesn't have a huge number of exceptions, but then you get to advanced organic chemistry. And it's like, okay, all that stuff you learned Okay, it's a little different here, and it's a little different here, and so, and it just becomes a whole bunch of random things. 
and it gets very aggravating. It loses all of its beauty, in my opinion. So um, it's just very important. What's that? Kind of just memorization at that point. Well, not, not really. It's knowing how to use the information, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's being able to compile it. It's being able to understand things. And this class, as much as we like to tell you organic chemistry isn't about memorization, there's a ton. Because there's going to be at least 80 different chemicals that cause do all kinds of different things that you need to know about. And the key is not to learn them as 80 separate things, but to learn them in groups so that you can say, well, this kind of chemical does this, but it does something very similar over here and something very similar over here. So mm -hmm. this kind of chemical will change a double bond into a single bond. So that's more the focus of the end of this semester and really the focus of all of next semester is how to put these atoms together to make complicated molecules. Hmm. How to make aspirin, for example, from more simple compounds. Okay. Okay, now this doesn't work for ethene, also called ethylene. This has two carbons, but only four hydrogens. Once we get a double bond, the situation becomes a little different. How many atoms does this carbon need to bond to? Because it's got a double bond, it's not bonding to four atoms, it's bonding only to three. three because two of, the, uh, two of the bonds go to the same atom. When you only need to make bonds to three different atoms, you don't need three hybrid orbitals. You only need uh, four hybrid orbitals. You only need two. So you leave one of them alone and you only hybridize three of the orbitals. You always take the S, and then you take, you always want to take the lowest one, the S, and then you'll take two of the P's. And instead of calling this SP3, we call this SP2. Because it comes from an S, a P, and a P. And it's easier to write SP2 than SPP. But this orbital doesn't go away. It's still there, and it still has an electron. And it's going to be used to make a different kind of a bond that we'll see in a second. So this is what we get with sp2s. These grayish, now I'm colorblind and I can never tell the difference between gray and green. These are gray, right? My colorblindness yeah. should not, what's that? Yes, those okay. are gray. My colorblindness should let me tell the difference between green, green and gray, but I can't even tell the color difference in my carpet. My carpet is gray and I think it's green, but fine, anyway. So we've got three of them, plus we have the leftover. What's this guy in the middle left over? That's the P orbital, okay? These guys are all 120 degrees to each other. What shape do we call that? Three groups that are 120 degrees to each other is what shape? Trigonal planar. No. Excellent, trigonal planar, good. And so you could probably guess the shape of this carbon is going to be trigonal planar. What angles approximately are trigonal planar? What number are these all very close to? 120, 120. 120, 120 yeah. So these are about 120. In this perfect model, this is 120, 120, 120. On the other hand, the P orbital is perpendicular to all of them. So it's often it's own way. It's, it's not in the same plane. So the p orbitals are not in the plane here. They are above and below, sticking straight up and straight out. So the orbital picture of that molecule looks like this. Each of the grays will overlap with another gray or an atomic orbital. And whenever they overlap like this, we call that a sigma bond. So that's a sigma bond right there. That's a sigma bond. Here's a sigma bond. Here's a sigma, here's a sigma. And that's generally the strongest kind of bond, sigma bonds. It's still a covalent bond, okay? These are all covalent bonds. So there's only two kinds of overlap, either right on top of each other 
or these p orbitals, which are not on top of each other, but what are they to each other? Geometri geometrically, what term would we use? They are parallel. Parallel. parallel, yeah. And that's kind of where pi, that's actually not where pi comes from. Pi comes from p, p orbitals, but parallel p, think of it that way. So this is when they are parallel to each other. And when they're parallel to each other like that, they have a little kind of bit of an orbital or, or overlap, or we can kind of smush them, but they're smaller overlap. And that generally means you have a weaker bond, okay? When they're parallel like that. So the double bond is what? It's a sigma bond and a pi bond. bond. Yeah, so one sigma and one pi. The first bond will always be a sigma. Any additional bonds are always going to be pi in this class anyway. When you get into advanced inorganic, you get into delta bonds too, and we don't worry about them. What kind of orbitals would you need for delta if you were to guess? If pi is p, delta would be uh, d, d. d orbitals, yeah. Okay. And that's so far beyond me that I don't know anything about it. Okay, so I can't tell you, other than they're cool and they look like flowers merging on top of each other. And that's the end of it. Okay. So when we get to these guys here, then we run into the same issue with bonding MOs and antibonding O's. If we're using P orbitals, they are overlapping across each other with parallel directions. And so instead of drawing it like this, we usually draw them smeared out, like you see right here, okay? So this is P orbitals that are parallel to each other, smeared out on top of each other. So that's a pi bond. And for every bond, there must also be a what? A and T bond, okay? So if electrons go into a pi bond, it makes them more stable. But if they go into an antibond, it makes them less stable. What do you suppose this dashed line stands for in between? That's a region the electrons can't be. That's called a node. A node. Good. Good. Electrons like to fill these bonds here, but if they fill an antibond, it's repulsive. It repels between them. So. Okay. Why do we know methane is not sp2? Why can't methane be sp2? Methane sp uh, methane was CH4. Why can't it be sp2? Because it makes four bonds. Yeah, it needs to make four bonds, and those bonds all need to be 109.5. Doesn't work because these are all 120, and there's only room to make four bonds. I mean, three bonds. We need to make four, so it doesn't work. Uh, where are we time-wise? 115 to 245. Okay, so I've got a few more minutes to finish this part off and then we'll take a break, okay? Uh, breaks are important, I know. Um, and then finally, what if we have a triple bond like we have here? This is called acetylene. I think we talked about it yesterday or on Monday, briefly. How many different atoms is the carbon bonded to in acetylene? Two. Two. By the way, again, this does correspond to your notes. I've got it. Where are they? Right there. Okay. If it's bonded to two other atoms, then it doesn't need to be sp3 or sp2. It only needs two orbitals. So we call that sp hybridized but we have left over two of the 2p orbitals. What angle are 2p orbitals to each other always? P orbitals are always what angle to each other? 90. 90 degrees, yeah, they are perpendicular. And they're also gonna be perpendicular to the sps, as we will see. Okay. So the orbital picture looks like this for that molecule. 
So each carbon has two sp orbitals. So this carbon here that you see, actually, let me take this one over here. Here's an sp orbital. And it's using that sp orbital to bond with hydrogen. And then on the other side is the other sp orbital. And what is it using this sp orbital here to bond with? Carbon. The other carbon, right? So these carbons are sharing, they each have an sp orbital and they're overlapping and they form what kind of a bond if they're overlapping like that? A sigma bond. Here is a leftover p orbital that has an electron in it. And then here's the other p orbital that was left over. They are 90 degrees to each other. And what will they use those p orbitals to do? They will use them to make pi bonds. Pi bonds. So how many bonds do we see total here uh, between carbons? Forget the hydrogens. But between carbons, how many bonds total are there? There is one. Two, sigma bond. There is a pi bond, which is going, oops, it's kind of hard to see here. But this pi bond goes above and below. That's this one right here, above and below. And then there's this pi bond, which goes out and away, out and in. Which is the strongest of the three bonds? Sigma. The sigma because it has the most overlap. Yeah, the more overlap in the orbitals, the stronger they generally are. Okay. So as I said here, a sigma bond should be stronger because it has more overlap of the space. The more overlap of the volume of the orbitals, the stronger the bond. Okay. What should be longer, sp3, sp3 sigma bond or sp, sp? Let's compare. This is what, what? This carbon is using an sp, this carbon is using an sp. So this is a sp, sp. Where did we use sp3, sp3? sp3, sp3 was way back here. Uh, actually, it wasn't any of there. That was the one in the notes. This is page number uh, one dash, this is page eight, sp3, sp3. So this bond, should it be longer or shorter than this bond? Which is longer? And it's kind of tricky, but it's not, but understanding it's a little tricky. SP3, SP3 is longer because why? SP3s look more like what kind of orbital? P's or S's? Do an audio. P's. P's. They look more like P orbitals. And remember, P orbitals were long, right? They were long tubular kind of orbitals. SP orbitals though, aren't quite as long. They're more, they're more round. Can you see how, I, I know it's hard to see in this picture here by itself, but it's more round. It doesn't stick out as far. If we were to just draw them in general, you know, an sp3 orbital is more like that. An sp2 is a little bit rounder and not quite as long. And an SP is, is rounder. I know that doesn't look very round, but it's even rounder still. And the roundness keeps it closer to the carbon. Okay. We say SP3 has the most P character because it's mostly made up of Ps. And this one has more S character. It's half S, half P. Okay. So the more SP, the shorter the bonds get. So if you were to look at figure or table 1.2 in the book, 
which bond is longest of these guys? It's the one with the sp3, sp3. What's the bond here between these guys? SP2, 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 good. And this one is? SP. SP, SP, uh, the sigma bond. Okay, and then there's pi bonds here. Uh, so the longest bond is the sp3, sp3. Which bond by itself is the strongest? Now this is tricky. The bond energy gets bigger and bigger as you go towards the triple bond. The triple bond is the strongest bond, right? But is it three times as strong as this one? No. No, it's less. What this means is the sigma bond is the strongest. When you add a double bond, is it twice as much or not quite twice as much? Twice as much. Not as much. Yeah, it's not quite as much. So the, the pi bond does definitely make the bond stronger, but not as strong as if you had two sigma bonds. And you can't have two in between because there can only be one spot right in the middle. So each pi bond makes the bond stronger, but not by as much as a sigma. So the sigma bonds are the strongest. And the pi bond just adds it, makes it a little bit stronger. Well, not a little. It's about two thirds as strong as a sigma. And why again? Because a sigma bond has a lot of overlap and a pi bond less overlap. 